um, uh, please join us. And yeah, Darren, floor, the floor is yours. Great. Uh, thank you all for tuning in and thank you, Mehrot, for hosting us and uh, organizing this great event. Uh, it's been already a great start to our International Education Week, and I hope that you'll find the rest of the week very useful. Uh, I have a presentation for you, which is partly in Russian, partly in English. I'll try to speak clearly so people can follow along. Uh, this video will also be added to our embassy's YouTube channel and U.S. Embassy website later. And you'll see links at the end of our presentation to the U.S. Embassy website if you're not already, already familiar with how to get there. So how to, how to choose a major seems like a pretty simple uh, question at first, but it can actually have very profound effects on your life and on your educational course. Um, there's a lot of factors to consider. I'll highlight some of those in my presentation today. And you'll be able to follow along uh, with the PowerPoint and uh, ask questions in the chat function. And we'll try to respond to those as we go along. Uh, let me get my screen shared for you, and then we can start. Okay, whoops. I started in the middle here. Let me go back. So, how to choose a major. So first, you want to ask yourself a number of questions. One of those is, what are you good at doing? What am I good at? Also, what do you like to do? Sometimes those two things are different. Um, there's a lot of things I like to do that I'm not that good at. I like to play music, uh, but I'm not a great musician, unfortunately. So that's why I didn't choose that for my career. Also, you want to ask yourself, how much money would you like to earn in your career? Obviously, everyone likes money. Um, but some people don't need that much to be happy. Some people will never be satisfied with a, a regular income, so they need to uh, aim for something higher. Also, where do you want to live? Uh, if you want to live in your home country, then different job opportunities might be available than if you want to live abroad, like in Europe or in the United States or anywhere. Um, if, for example, you study to be a lawyer, well, that might help you in the country where you study law, but in any other country, you have a different legal system. So it's very difficult to use that degree overseas. You also want to ask what skills are in demand in society. Sometimes uh, skills are in demand right now, but five years from now, maybe less so. So you have to predict the future a little bit and plan ahead. The last question might sound silly, but it's also useful. Um, can your job be done by computers or robots? or in the near future, could it be done by them? Because a lot of jobs are moving to automation. A lot of jobs are becoming automatic. And so if you study a long time to do a very simple task, and then someone else uh, invents a computer that can do it for you, then you'll be out of a job. So you might want to have a backup plan. You might want to also understand your own personality. There's a famous test, personality test, called the Myers-Briggs test. Uh, you can take it yourself online for free at this website here, mbtonline.com. And based on that, you get a sense of what, uh, what things might interest you more. For example, if you're extroverted, you might like being into government work, politics, dealing with people, customer service, uh, being a diplomat, for example. If you're more introverted, you might do it, prefer doing research or studies or, you know, working the archives, doing something where you don't have to interact as much. Um, but there are people who are extroverted uh, in those fields, and there are people who are introverted who work alongside me as uh, diplomats where we have to uh, interact a lot. And you just find your comfort zone. Everyone has their own strengths. But if your personality is very extreme in one direction, and you choose a job which is in another direction, it can be uh, difficult for you or stressful uh, to continue in that career. There are some concrete steps which you can take to help you choose your profession. Um, it might not work always in is the same in Tajikistan as it would in the United States or elsewhere, but a lot of these principles are the same uh, anywhere you are. And if you're studying at a university in America, then you can, of course, basically participate in all of these steps that I've listed here. Uh, the first is to 
check which vacancies are available online. Uh, you can look overseas. Uh, there's different websites abroad like monster.com or others where you can check to see, all right, these are the jobs that are most often advertised. That means these jobs and skills are in high demand. And that's why I should study this field so I can get a secure job later. You can also see what their salaries are typically. So you can get a sense of what job would give you what salary. That's the second point there. There's some websites I'll show you in a minute that can tell you exactly on average what the salary is for different specialties um, when you graduate. You can also uh, find which jobs are connected to which specialties. Uh, some jobs require certain specialties, obviously medical fields, doctors require have a medical degree, lawyers require a law degree, but there's a lot of other fields that require a specialized degree uh, or a master's or a doctorate degree before you can start. When you're a university in America, you can start your first year without choosing a specialty. You can wait until your second or even third year. And during that first year and second year, you can try different classes, a lot of different classes and decide which ones you like more, which ones are more interesting. Also, I think both in Tajikistan and in the United States, but probably more so abroad, you can find an internship in the field which interests you and see if you like working in that kind of field in that office. Also, after this whole coronavirus uh, crisis is over, hopefully you will be able to go to job fairs uh, if you're a student studying in the United States. These are fairly common at universities and even in small towns, uh, not every week, but certainly uh, somewhat often they hold job fairs where employers come to a location where they advertise their business and give you informational leaflets, pamphlets that talk about working there and explain it to you in person. You can also reach out directly to people who are working in the field that interests you and email them or call them, ask them what it's like to have that job, interview them even. And uh, some people will be very friendly, some people won't wanna talk, but if you uh, try a number of people, I'm sure someone will be happy to tell you about their career. There's some websites here I mentioned earlier these tell you um, what kind of uh, salaries you can expect after studying in different fields. And it's not obviously guaranteed. You might have, you might be unemployed, so you might not get any salary, or you might become one of the leaders in your field and then get a much higher than average salary. But uh, this gives you some sense of uh, the general range, which fields will give you more or less money on average. I've got a few screenshot examples here from the website Glassdoor. You can see that on the previous page, glassdoor.com, salaries, know your worth. And for an example, diplomats, American diplomats are called foreign service officers. This tells you their average base pay in the Washington DC area, because depending on where you work in a different city or a different country, the base pay, the average pay is going to be different. So people who go on to become diplomats have all different kinds of backgrounds. You don't have to have a specialty in the field of government, public administration. You can come from law, education, history, politics, international relations, journalism, um, basically anything. And so this goes to show you that even if you choose a major, which is not on the list of the most highly paid, there are some jobs out there where you can get a good salary. In the United States, that is considered a good salary. I have next to that engineer salaries underneath. Engineering in general is the highest paid field of study, uh, but you can see that in Washington DC, the average base pay is actually a little bit less than you would find for a diplomat, a foreign service officer. But in general, if you go into the field of engineering, you will likely at some point in your career make more money than the average diplomat. I liked the idea of becoming a teacher when I was younger. My parents were both teachers. Two of my grandparents were teachers. One was a professor. And um, my parents were a little bit discouraging. They said that um, you don't make enough money in teaching and you can make a pretty good salary as a teacher, uh, depending 
depending on what your goal is. But you can see on average that uh, the teaching field, education field, pays a bit less than engineering or diplomacy or other jobs. Obviously, being a doctor or a lawyer, uh, business will often pay higher. But you can still make a decent money, a de decent salary in the United States as a teacher. And then I put down here at the bottom, a uh, bus driver. Uh, before I became a diplomat, I was actually a bus driver for a little while at a ski resort. And you can see the uh, average base pay there in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, it may look like a lot, but actually, if you're living in Washington, D.C., you could expect to pay that much money just for rent for the year uh, if you have a two-bedroom apartment. Uh, with a one-bedroom apartment, you might be able to survive on that and uh, very economically with groceries and so on. But it'll be very difficult to live on that salary in the Washington, D.C. area. This is another website uh, which has a list of all the top um, paying salaries by major. And it talks about both your early career pay when you first join the workforce and your mid-career pay later, like let's say 15 years into your career, how much money you can expect to make. Because obviously your salary on average goes up as you get more senior in your organization and have more skills. So the ones here that are in green are all engineering related. So you can see engineering dominates the highest uh, rungs of salary by major. Other ones, you see accounting, mathematics, actuarial science, that's basically accounting. Uh, and there's some IT fields they enter around here. You can't see the color very well, but there's a number of IT ones that are highlighted with kind of a, a grayish purple color. Generally speaking, these are all hard sciences and hard math fields that are at the top. You don't see history, international relations, political science, journalism entering the highest paid fields. You see government up there, that's relatively high. Uh, business and economics is relatively high. Japanese, uh, I think that often goes with business majors and that's probably why that's higher. Economics is relatively high. You start to see a little bit more diversity as you go down, but still the majority of these are going to be in the fields of engineering, information technology, business, economics, accounting, and then some hard sciences and math. You might also want to know how much competition do you have? Uh, is everyone studying the same thing I am? Because that means four years from now or six years from now, I will have a lot of competition um, in, the, business, in the, the job sector where I am. You can see overall business majors are the most popular, at least in the United States. Other fields uh, are all pretty similar level. Agriculture, not very popular. Law, relatively less. Industrial arts. Uh, computer sciences are, are somewhat popular. Education is very popular. Humanities is very popular in the United States. This includes political science, history, international relations. Um, so in America, I think it's more popular than you would find in Tajikistan or in many other countries. Um, so there's a lot of job competition for people with humanities and liberal arts majors. I personally studied history and it was not a great, um, there was a low chance of having a good highly paid job, but still I found one. Uh, so you can find a good job from any of these fields. Your chances are just a little bit lower or higher and you have to work a bit harder to, to get, find those jobs. There's also job security to consider, whoops. So certain fields are more likely to have unemployment. You can see from this list, architecture actually has the highest unemployment rate, people that study architecture. Yet past that would be the arts. If you go into you know, painting, sculpture, uh, design, that also has a higher unemployment rate. The lowest unemployment rates, the most secure job fields are education, health, and, uh, sorry, where is it here? Agriculture and natural resources. Relatively, they're all pretty similar here, but you see some peaks and some valleys. So that gives you a sense of how secure your job career, your career path is. You can see some different salaries I've listed here, for example, in the, the business, or sorry, in the uh, different specialties. 
Um, there's a range because some of these are in different age ranges. So the dark blue is uh, later in your career after the first few years. Light blue is in your first few years of employment. This is the first job you get in your field. A lot of people get disappointed that the first job is not their favorite and it's not the, um, the salary they hoped for. But if you stay in just a little bit longer, you see age 21 to 24, and then age 25 to 59, there's a pretty big difference in the average salary in all of these fields. And you can read down the list here um, how they differ depending on what you study. This is just another slide that I couldn't fit on the last page. So this shows you some other examples. This page, if you can see it okay, it gives you the list of all these fields, the general fields of study, and the lowest percentile of pay and the highest percentile and the middle or the median. And so you can see, with the exception maybe of chemical engineering, which is very highly paid, if you go into education, which is by this marker, the lowest paid field or social work, even if you're at the highest end of your pay scale, you can still match a lot of the other salaries on this list, engineering and so on. So if you work very hard and you're um, an expert in your area, whatever field you decide to study in, you can still make a good salary. That's what I believe is the message of this chart. Obviously, your starting salary for a chemical engineer is going to be higher than the median salary for an education or social worker. But as you move up in your field, you can still match some of those higher paid salaries, depending which field you're in. As we talked about already, these are the highest paying fields um, to study, all pretty much engineering, with one exception of astronomy and astrof astrophysics, and also actuarial science, which is accounting. Uh, this would be if you want to go into the uh, rocket making business, which can also be lucrative if you if you find a job, obviously. And these are the lowest paying on average um, specialties, library science, counseling psychology, clinical psychology, educational psychology, zoology, composition and rhetoric, drama and theater arts, foreign languages, early childhood education, and communication disorder science and services. One of these, I believe for you, is a bit uh, misleading. Foreign languages in the United States is a relatively uh, lower paid field of study, whereas in most of the world, if you include English as one of your languages or any of the world languages, you are going to increase your chance of making a higher salary. So do keep that in mind. Don't worry about the foreign languages one. Uh, that is a good idea for anybody who does not have English as their first language. This page is a bit full, sorry about that, but I'll just try to summarize here. Some people ask, why do you study liberal arts humanities if they're not going to help you get a high salary? I studied history, which is a liberal arts, and it really worked out very well for me. And this gives you some examples on why this is an important thing. So you can also learn different skills, especially uh, writing, critical thinking. These skills are important in every field, being able to organize your thoughts and arguments. These are the things that a lot of employers are looking for now. Um, I also suggest that uh, if you do study liberal arts, you might want to have a skill or something else that you can offer in the job field. Um, a foreign language is a skill. So just having English, most of you must have some English if you're listening to this. So this can be a skill besides having um, having a, di a dipl diploma in uh, humanities, sorry. So it's good to also have some liberal arts classes if you study a hard science. You can have some balance there. Um, you have to um, have a well-rounded background and this helps you also interact with different cultures to understand different work environments and work cultures. And uh, this makes you a little bit more flexible as a worker, so you can pick up new skills easily. Uh, one thing that's relatively uncommon as a diplomat is to come from a highly specialized field, 
like chemical engineering, for example, or medicine, uh, because people who study those fields tend to really focus on their specialty and they don't learn as much about liberal arts, humanities, and other t- subjects. And so it's hard for them, a little bit harder for them to pick up some of the nuances of, of our work. And that can be true of a lot of fields. So there's also changing, um, changing uh, needs in the job market. So having that well-rounded background can help you, um, help you be flexible when, when the demanded jobs change. There's some interesting resources offered by different uh, universities that help you choose your major. I went online to one of these, uh, luke.luc.edu, and filled out about 40 questions. I answered 40 questions, and then they told me what my ideal major would be, and they said environmental policy, which I think uh, makes sense because I do like government and public policy issues, and I've always been interested in the environment. And so I think uh, that was a relatively accurate depiction of what I, I would like to do with my life. Uh, it's not exactly what I'm doing. I do have some of my work that overlaps with environmental issues, but um, you know, I wasn't uh, as keen on science, as interested in science back then as I might be now, so I chose history. These are some other useful sites, useful websites you can go to. Some of these are probably very familiar to you. Obviously, the U.S. Embassy in Tajikistan's website, this is available in Russian and Tajiki as well as English. Uh, our Facebook page, the embassy also has Twitter and Instagram and YouTube. There's Education USA in Tajikistan, which is also active um, besides Facebook on Twitter and, and uh, Instagram. American Space Dushanbe. Uh, Some of you are tuning in from other cities. I didn't want to fill the whole page here with all the American space links, but uh, as you probably know, we have spaces in Hujand, Kulob, Bokhtar, Garm, Panjakent, Isfra, and Harog, in addition to uh, Dushanbe. These sites here were shown earlier in the presentation, and they tell you about different salaries that you can expect in different majors. And uh, I'll leave this on for just a second. And then I'll go back to my screen so you can see me again. But um, one thing to keep in mind is that we focused a lot on this presentation on the salary impact of different majors. But I do not want you to think that should be your only factor or your main factor in deciding a specialty. If we go back to our first slide, let me um, do that for a second. This is really your decision points here. You want to ask yourself all of these questions. What am I good at doing? What do I like to do? How much money would I like to make? Where do I want to live? What knowledges and knowledge and skills are going to be in demand in society now and in the future? And could computers or robots do my job uh, at some point in the near future? The most important questions are probably the first two, because if you're not good at something and you don't like doing it, you probably will not be successful. Uh, I can almost guarantee if both of those uh, answers are no, I don't like doing it and I'm not good at it, uh, I can almost guarantee you will not be successful and you'll probably somehow quit, change your career at some point, change your study, your field of study. And so you want to make sure that at least one of those questions is yes. I like doing it, or at least I'm good at it. Uh, Ideally, you want to have both of those things be yes. And then how much money you want to make is really a secondary question. Where you want to live, that depends on who you are. That can be very important or not that important. Um, But if you really want to live, let's say, uh, in Europe or in the United States, studying law in Tajikistan probably will not help you very much because the legal system is going to be different. So there's a few fields like that Uh, where obviously they're not going to help you as much overseas. Or if you want to study, you know, uh, Japanese, for example, but you don't want to live in Japan, uh, probably not the best course of study because you don't want to live in Japan. So you could be a translator, of course, but, um, you know, think about all your options and what makes the most sense for you. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing the screen here and I'll be back on my video.
hopefully you can see me now. So uh, I'm open to questions if anybody has them. Uh, otherwise, um, that's the conclusion of the, the main portion of my presentation. Well, thank you so much, Darren. It was very informative. And uh, we have actually a couple of the questions by other audience. And I will also add some uh, mm -hmm. questions based on your presentation. Uh, so the first question was by Jomiev Yusuf. Let me read the question is, um, how we can uh, how we can be, uh, how we can find fully funded scholarships in the U.S., which doesn't re require TOEFL or SAT. Um, I think this this question is uh, more likely should be referred to Education USA. But if you have any knowledge on that, you can take it up. Sure, I would definitely advocate Education USA as your primary resource for this question. Uh, there's a a lot of different opportunities for uh, for students out there, including international students like yourself. Um, there's not always going to be a scholarship for you. Some universities will not offer full scholarships for international students or for any students, really. Uh, but most offer some level of scholarship and financial aid. Uh, some, many, I would say, most offer full ride scholarships, full scholarships to to certain people with certain qualifications. Uh, you do really have to be an exceptional student, uh, an exceptional candidate to to qualify for those full scholarships. Um, just being a good student, having you know fives in your school, uh, will help. But it's not uh, it's not the only thing that they consider. They want to see that you have a lot of activities outside of school that you're excelling in, volunteer work, leadership activities. Maybe you've started your own business or your own organization. Uh, something that shows that you are a very unique and exceptional person who they hope will be some kind of a leader in your society in the future, maybe even a leader of government or a leader in the business industry. Um, so you want to really show your strength in any way you can. Uh, having a high TOEFL score is basically a minimum requirement to get a high scholarship. Um, so you would want to have very fluent English and um, also probably some other scores, depending on what you study, what you apply for. SAT, ACT for undergraduate, or GRE, LSAT, GMAT for graduate school, depending on your field of study. Yeah, um, so the next question would be, um, who usually helps students to choose their major in the United States? Because in, in, in Tajikistan, students uh, should um, research by their own and then choose one major. So what was in your case, for example? Sure, that's a good question. In the United States, officially, you have someone at your high school uh, from grades 9 to 12 who is supposed to be your guidance counselor, someone who is an expert in these fields, uh, who usually has a psychology degree, but is also like an Education USA advisor. And they understand more or less the requirements for different universities and what you can do with different uh, majors, different specialties. And whenever you have a question, you can go to that person and ask them you know, to sit down and, and talk through it and they can give you some advice and point you in the right direction. Uh, in practice, I would say not everyone uses that resource, um, maybe not even a majority. I only talked to my guidance counselor a couple times. Uh, mostly people are deciding on their own uh, with conversations with their parents and their friends and also through a little bit of, of trial and error uh, experimentation once you go to university. One of the big differences about studying in the United States is when you start as a freshman, first year university student, you do not have to have a major declared. Some people do, they already know what their specialty will be, but most, I don't know what the percentage is, but definitely most, go into university without a final decision on what they will study. And most people decide near the end of the first year in school or sometime during their second year in school, in university, I should say. I, I decided the second semester of my second year in university. So my fourth semester in university, I decided what my major would be. And it did not hurt me at all. I had already taken some, field, some classes in that field. And uh, that's pretty common. Some people it might slow them down if they decide later, uh, depending on your specialty. But uh, for the most part, you have at least that first year to decide. 
And sometimes in practice, your parents are very highly influential. They will like in, I'm sure in Tajikistan and any society, your parents might say, this is what you should study. We won't support you if you study something else, or they'll be very, you know, yeah. disappointed if you pick a field that they don't like. Um, so that can have a big effect even in America. And so my parents were not happy with my uh, choice, um, but they didn't tell me I couldn't do it. And so I did it anyhow and uh, it caused some tension, but eventually I got a good job and I think they, uh, they agreed that it wasn't, it wasn't the worst idea ever. And so uh, it worked out in the end. Yeah. Um, uh, so it takes me to another question is that, so you have mentioned also about the languages and um, so now in the marketing job is a lot of people treat like learning languages as, as, as a skill, but not a major. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, take it, uh, taking that into account, what do you think, what is the highest paid job uh, in terms of, you know, studying humanitarian subjects? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, in terms of foreign languages, I think uh, that slide I showed, like I mentioned, was a bit misleading because really uh, for anyone right now listening to this in Tajikistan, uh, English should be at the top of your list of fields to study. And that does not mean that you have to be a specialty, have a specialty in English. Um, you should be studying English, but you probably want to have another major. Unless you want to be an English teacher, you will probably want to study something else as your main specialty. Uh, because speaking English is helpful, obviously, but they want you to also do something besides that, uh, unless you're a translator, interpreter, or English teacher. So um, that's one point on, on languages. With other fields like history, international relations, political science, sociology, let's say, um, psychology without a PhD, some of these fields, anthropology maybe, some of these fields have a scientific component, um, but there's a lot of humanities aspects to them. And it depends on how far you go. If you just have a bachelor's degree, for example, in humanities, it can be very difficult to find a job that pays very well or a job at all that uses your knowledge. Uh, if you go on to get a master's degree or a doctorate, as we would say, PhD, uh, your job chances increase uh, significantly. There are a lot of international organizations, uh, not just the US Embassy, but there's obviously the United Nations, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, OBSA, um, many others that work with USAID, that uh, really wants someone who's well-rounded, has a lot of knowledge in the field of uh, societal issues, uh, culture, history, that can understand people, they understand how to write, they understand interpersonal skills, they have good interpersonal skills. And so someone coming in with a, a degree in chemical engineering might think this is a great idea uh, to make a lot of money, but if you're going to work for an international organization, uh, which in Tajikistan and, and many parts of uh, Central Asia might offer the highest salary, uh, it won't be as useful for you um, unless you're really in a specialized kind of uh, field, but those jobs are rare. And so I think um, humanities is different. It's differently in demand in different places. I think here in Tajikistan and Central Asia as a whole, uh, it can be more valuable than in the United States where we have a lot of people studying the field and not as many jobs. There's not as much development work going on or other types of uh, government politics type work. Most of those jobs are based overseas in places like this. That's partly why I'm here. I have a history major. If I stayed in Wisconsin in my hometown, probably I could not work uh, in my field unless I wanted to be a teacher or a professor. Um, there are some think tanks. There are some other uh, kind of educational research institutions I could work for, uh, but I would need to have a master's degree or a PhD probably to to go into those fields. So that's a good thing to keep in mind. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I think um, we don't have any question at the moment, but those who will join us later, they might ask questions. Uh, and uh, thank you so much once, once again. Um, and yeah, if you have any if you don't have any additional um, suggestions, uh, we can wrap it up. Um, yeah, nothing else uh, I can add at this moment. Just uh, do follow us on uh, social media and uh, you can look to see this uh, video later on YouTube and the embassy page. 
And if you miss something, you can check it out there. And just remember, uh, it's important. What are you good at and what do you like to do? Uh, those are the two questions you should always be asking yourself when deciding on your specialty, uh, your major, uh, as we say in English, and um, what kind of career you want. So start with those questions and then go from there. Uh, yeah, uh, and please stay tuned for our next sessions tomorrow because they, they, those are very important, if you, especially if you need full-funded scholarships and you know, other um, uh, supportive funds. Thank you so much for, uh, for joining us.